Hi, I'm Esper and welcome to this video lecture on visualization of interval and major data. Interval and major data are data that can be where a difference between di different data values can be quantified. But we'll talk about that in a moment. First of all, remember the basic rules of simplification in a GIS is that we have some spatial data, they have some attribute data, and then we apply some visualization rules that say, okay, this type of attribute data is going to be visualized like this or that. These, how we visualize depends very much about what type of data it is. And there are basically four types of data one should consider when one visualizes data. There's nominal data, that is data that is simply grouping or categorized where there's no order between things. So we have river, forest, tree, church, airport, harbor, whatever. All of these categories have no internal ordering. They're different things with the same right. The next type, and the, the thing you should remember is that if they are things of the same type, the same ordering, you um, should make sure that the symbols reflect this. So you should choose to different symbols that say what they are. So the airplane saying it, say airport, church, mine, schools, towns, so on. These symbols are made so they do not have any internal ordering. The school doesn't look to be more than the town or the mine. So there's no internal order in the simplification of them. Ordinal data is a grouping of phenomena where there is some form of scale from small, medium, large, from hamlet to village to town to city, from dirt track to secondary road to primary road to George carriageway to motor road all of these things that is some form of internal ordering a motor road is more than a primary road and a primary road is more than a dirt track but how much that can't be quantified we can only say that it is more and we should then for ensure that our simplification indicates that they are more but not lead or but don't lead the reader to try and quantify it by looking at how thick lines are. For instance, in Denmark a motor road is a thicker line than the primary road, but it's also a different colour. So the primary road is black, the motor road is red. So in a, that adding of the colour is to ensure that the person Reading the map doesn't try to compare the width of the primary road to the most road in order to get some idea of how much more it is. We are indicating by using different widths but also using different symbols to ensure that it is more but we won't, you can't find out how much more it is because that's not part of the data type. Ordinal data, we can say that it is more but not how much more. As opposed to this, interval and major data, here we can quantify the difference. And therefore in our visualization, we should ensure that our ways of simulation also allows for a quantif quantifiable comparison, Circle, sizes of circles, densities of colors, whatever. In general, in GIS and data visualization, there's not much difference between interval and major data. <coughs> yeah, we use more or less the same tools. There's one little subtle difference that should, one should note. Interval data can only be compared by subtraction. You can say that the temperature has risen from 10 degrees to 20 degrees, so it's 10 degrees warmer. You can't say that it is now double as warm as it was because 
when we're talking about the centigrade temperature, the zero is not the absolute zero. There are negative values, and therefore 10 degree, 20 degrees is not the double of 10 degrees. However, in ratio data, there is an absolute zero. So we can compare also by division. We can say that if this lecture is boring so that we started out with 20 viewers and ended up with 10, we can say that there's only half as many as there was when the video started. So we can talk about ratio data in that sense. But as I said, when visualization has not much difference between those two types of data. When we visualize, we have basically six different elements we can work with. We have shape or symbols, so we can give different elements different symbols. We have the hue. Hue is a way of color coding. Um, you probably know RGB, red, green, blue, which is what computer screens use. But in cartography, we typically use hue, value, and saturation. Um, I can show this if I go into QGIS. In um, QGIS, I can control colors using both RGB and hue hue value and saturation color regimes. So if I just double click this color here and go to its style and choose its color I can um, choose color and here we see at the top we have hue, saturation and value and here we have R, G and B. So the hue is a value between 0 and 360 degrees, so it's a color wheel where we have all the colors along this wheel. So as we change the hue, we change the color. But different colors can have different degrees of saturation. So we can increase the saturation of the color. So now they are more saturated, these colors. Or we can work with the value. Both saturation and value go from 0 to 100%. And uh, if we have a value of 0, there's no light present here. And here we have full lighting. And saturation is the percentage of the color. So these hue, saturation and value are alternative coloring to the R, G and B. So if I go and say 100% R, I know G and know B, I'll have a pure red color, which is the value 0 and the hue. But if I change the hue, you can see how the different sliders of red, green and blue move systematically across as I go through the color wheel. So hue is the angle on the color wheel from 0 to 360 degrees. And what is important here is that we do not ha we have values with the same saturation and value. Just changing the hue. Then we have orientation. So if you have a simple which way is a, sim is a simple pointing. We have value and saturation. We have the size of objects and we have the texture. What's interesting to this one is that the top three here, the shape, the hue and the orientation are all appropriate for nominal data. And to some degree if we have ordinal data, but not. This one down here are primarily for interval and ratio data. So if you have a lake, we'll make it blue. If it's a forest, we'll make it green. If it's a town, we make it red. If you have a high elevation, we can make it dense. If we have many unemployed, we can have a dense color. And if there are few unemployed, we can have a less dense. Or if there are 
many high educated people who have a large circle and if there are few we have a large or small circle or if we have many we can have some thick stripings and there are few we can have some thin stripings. There are different ways of using these tools but basically shape, hue and orientation are for nominal data value, hue, uh, sorry, value and uh, saturation, size and texture are for ordinal and primarily for interval and ratio data. In QGIS, when we want to symbolize a layer, we go into the properties of the layer, we right click the layer and go properties, and we start out with the style tab. On the style tab, we can do different things. We can choose on the style drop down, we can choose to have it gradiated. That is what we normally use for interval and ratio data. And furthermore, we have also got the possibilities of making charts as an overlay to an existing map. These charts can either be pie charts or histograms. So you can have one a map showing the average income and then we can have a pie chart on top of that showing the distribution of education levels. So that's the two basic tools we have for symbolizing interval and ratio data in QGIS. We can go radiated colors and we can add a overlay of pies or histograms. If you go for the gradiated colors, we will come we will get this dialog box here. Uh, first we have a column that is the attribute we choose to control our color with. So what are we mapping? It can either be an attribute alone or it can be a formula based on one or more attributes. We have a basic coloring scheme, so and basic what is missing is is it a hatched or not ha filled color? That's basically what is controlled. We can specify how we want to write the intervals. If we want a hyphen, or we say from to or hard brackets or whatever we want to do. We can round off the decimal places, so we have rounded it down to two decimal places. We can choose our color ramp, so which color flow is you going from here light red to dark red we can choose which type of classification we use we can go in and look at the distribution of the data through looking at the data histogram or frequency diagram we can specify how many number of classes we want in our classification we can manually go in and change the classification breaks here by editing these numbers or we can manually change the label of the classification by editing these numbers. So if we go into QGIS and uh, close this and then go to gradiated we first choose a value, let's say average income We then choose that we want, let's say, 10 classes. We can choose which type of classification we want. I want quartiles, they're different, we'll talk about them in a moment. And I can choose my color ramp, different color schemes we've got here. Which one we want? So, Income, we could go from light to dark pinkish color here. And we see that the dark areas have the highest income and the light areas have the lowest income. If I expand it over here, I will have the legend of the income intervals. So that's the basic of it. Um, now, now there's one thing we might say now we here that if we go into our properties here, 
this value goes is a range. We can also go in and ask for colors that are not a range. So for instance, if I, ha I have something that's called sex ratio, which is the ratio of how many males per female. And if I apply this one, yeah, yeah, uh, it's not help, sorry, apply, ops, break, place, play, classify first and then apply. Good. And then we can see that we have um, high values up in this area. So we have here, we have many females, and here we have many males, or few females, so a low ratio and a high ratio. Um, so if I want to change this, say okay, in these low values we have many males and few females and in the high values we have many females and few males, we should ch choose a coloring scheme that mixes, matches this and you can go here and I have one that's called sex in Danish cut. And here we have high values in red and oh, low values in blue. So this, in this case we have two different values for each of the areas in our uh, color range. So blue, the bluer, you more males greater the more females. So we have two types of color ranges. One that is a monochrome going from one red, one color light to darker or more or less saturated or we have a dual chrome with going from blue to red. Matter of fact we could add, go over three different colors if you wish. So that's a color scheme and you can throw those up and the color ramp and if you don't like the ones that are there you can go in and create your own ones at the right bottom of it and that's how I made that one we have new color ramp and I want to choose between two ones I want to go from gradiated and I want to go from red to blue like that and now I have made a search of color map and in this case that's opposite of the ones I have so I'll just invert it and then my data is now shown in this new color map so we can control the colors from in here we also have this one in the histogram button. If you choose that one, we can go in and look at our data. First of all, you won't see anything and you have to press this load values to start it out. Then we will have the distribution of observations. In this case, we have the Danish municipalities, 99 of them. And each of them will be given a number here. So there's two municipalities between 0.9, uh, 49 and 0. whatever we have here. So in this interval here, we have two observations. We have six observations in this interval and five observations in this and so on. So the height of these bars indicate how many municipalities observations we have in each interval. And the black lines are our groupings. And we can change these by dragging them around. But we can look at how does our group values match our distributions. And basically that's because we have to think about what is a good interval to describe a data set. Um, basically, when we create intervals, what we often want to achieve is that we want as few observations at the edges and as many observations in the center of each interval. That is what we could call a good interval because that is a representative interval. This interval here is not really good because the observations are all in one end of the interval. So that, so saying that they are in the data are in this interval, we, we will 
logically think they are evenly distributed, but they are not in this case. All of them are in one side of the interval. So, a good interval is an interval where the largest amount of observations are in the center and the fewest at the edges. And this is why we use this histogram to go in and look are they good intervals the ones that we've got. We have different ways of automa making, automatically creating these intervals. We can go and say equal intervals. So what it will do is that it will create a number of classes and it distributes them even. We have quartiles. Quartiles, these will have the same amount, the same number of observations in each of them. Natural breaks or jinx, they really try and do something like equal intervals, but at the same time it looks at trying to minimize the variance between the, cla uh, between the classes and maximize the variance between the classes. Okay. That is what I said to think about having that fused observations at the borders and having the observations grouped at the center of the interval. Standard deviations. Typically we have a normal distributed data set, we'll talk about that. And then pretty breaks, which is basically the same as our natural breaks, but where the break values are rounded to integers, so they look nicer. But that's the only difference. So it's not really one itself, it's that. It's the natural breaks that are just rounded nicely. If we look here, I'll be using this example of sex ratio throughout Europe. Um, the redder the color, the more females, the bluer, the more males. It's the same data that will go through the next five slides over how many there are. And we'll have the distribution down here and the intervals here. So what we can see here, if we have equal intervals, typically our maps won't look nice. Um, because we'll typically have some areas here where very, very few observations right out in the extreme dark blue or in the extreme green red. And then we have a really lot of observations within two or four, in this case perhaps four classes. So basically all of this is only shown as four different classes, which doesn't really, it's not really showing the variation of the data set. So if you want to show how things vary through space, equal intervals are seldom a good choice. They can be nice because you can say, oh, well, I'm not fiddling with data. Each interval has the same width and so on. But from a mapping point of view, seldom useful. In the quartiles, or as they probably should be called fractiles, each interval is not, the intervals have not the same width, but each interval has the same number of observations within it. Uh, you should know you know these as um, this is the 10% if we have 10 intervals these is the 10% lowest and these are the 10% highest and then it, there will be 10% in each of our intervals. So that ensures that we have the maximum use of our colors on our map and we typically use quartiles or as I said they should be called fractiles because quartile indicates four we typically use that as a good way of classifying data from mapping because it ensures the most variation where each color is used the same amount. Natural breaks or jinx is a computer algorithm that looks at this frequency distribution or the histogram and then tries to optimize this so it tries to ensure that we have as many observations in the center and as few at the edges or it tries to optimize it so that we have a maximum variation between the classes and a minimum variation internally in the classes. So we should see that these break lines fall at places in the histogram where we have relatively few observations. Um, they are a bit peculiar because although they do generate good maps, they are difficult to explain how do we arrive at these intervals. But 
they are especially good if you want to have time series maps and you don't want too many of your areas to change through time so you want to make the map as stable as possible because we here have an optimization with many observations in the center of the intervals then the likelihood of a area, a feature class changing from one class to another through time is minimized so for historical maps, time series maps natural breaks are a good solution Standard deviations is probably one of these where you should be a wee bit careful about what you do because there's quite a lot of people that don't really know what a standard deviation is but what basically it does is that it has a typical value and then it has how strange observations are compared to this typical value but they only work if your data set it has a normal distribution so you have this typical bell curve and if you have that and your reader understands standard deviation it's good if you just take a look at what um, a standard deviation is I got it here um, we have that when plus minus one standard deviation we have 68% Point two of our observations. So, plus minus one standard deviation, that's more than half of our observations. If we go out and say plus minus two standard deviations, we have 95% of our observations. So, if anything is further out than two standard deviations, it's really peculiar. And if we then have the plus minus three standard deviations, we have this 99.7% and then we are really out in the really seldom occurring things if you have um, data there so that's if the data is normally distributed and if it is that and we are looking at this type of data scientific data from temperature uh, precipitation things like that where we expect some form of normal distribution or well, then standard deviation is a really good classification scheme um, I skip this one, but basically it's that you can always go in, never mind how you created your um, your categories by starting which type you start with, you can always go in and create your own ones by changing the values. This is typically something you want to do if you have some theoretical reason for why intervals will be as they are. You say that if there are uh, more then uh, half of the population that does not have a um, more than a primary education we might have an educational deficit or if we have um, more than 10% more males than females in the population we might have a demographic problem so we can set, if you have some theory that says where should the intervals be, we can set them manually uh, by going into our, in our QGIS, go in and say properties. And if I now change to, uh, having stay in 6 radio, but we don't want to, uh, we don't want to trim our data into integers. Um, we um, yeah, we can um, look at these values here and say okay uh, this value here should end at exactly half so 50 50 0.5 so I can double click it and I can go in and write 0.5 here so I have now forced this break line here to be 0.5. I can also do the same in my histogram here by dragging these lines so I can change how the classification is by simply dragging to the interval values I want. So there's two ways of changing them, drag and drop in here or edit the values here. So that's the basic colors. If we look at our diagrams, 
is that diagrams can be overlays. So we have these and we want to say okay. Um, wonder if we look at um, which type of secondary education, so gymnasium in Danish, people have. We can go in and say diagrams. And we could show diagrams, pie charts, and we could look at um, the two types of gymnasium. So the general gymnasium, academic gymnasium, and the vocational so that was gymnasium in Danish. Uh, and we can look at them and look at that distribution. If I just say apply, you can see the problem of course with this type of pie charts is that if you have one for each municipality, we have almost a hundred pie charts on a map of Denmark and that won't really look nice. You can also see that at the moment they are too big and we can go in and change the size of them. In this case they are all fixed to a specific size in millimeters. I can say okay that's too much I want them to be only 10 millimeters and say apply and then they will all shrink a bit but if I am zooming they will stay at 10 millimeters which might not be good. I instead I can go up and set them as map units so they relate to the size of them are in map units so in this case meters and I could say that each of them should be let's say uh, 20 kilometers and then so I apply well that would mean is that if I zoom in they will increase in size because then 20 kilometers increases in size this is a fixed value um, I could also go in and change um, the, them to be a scalable size and say for instance in this case that to be scaled to the sum of the two so we can see how many in general that go to one, any of these secondary educations so I'm going in this case and say that it should be the function so values of enemy gymnasium plus vocational gymnasium I don't need two pluses do I? like that and say OK I can ask it to find out what the range is so this I can see I can apply the size they have to be uh, much much larger um, okay, that was perhaps too much um, so, so now we can see if you look at the map, first of all, you can see that not many people go to the gymnasiums outside the towns, but of course that's because there are not very many people there. But we can also see that um, there are more people at the different types of gymnasium in the different um, uh, municipalities. If we wanted to compensate for how many there we will have to compensate for the population we can do that if we wish so um, we just divide it by the population and it will be normalized so we can put diagrams on top of our layers we can control the size of the diagrams and we can control the categories of them if I expand it you can see that that gray color there is the uh, normal gymnasium and the green is the Welsh gymnasium and we can then see that in uh, there is a difference in the different uh, not very many people go to the Welsh gymnasium here in uh, Slade's municipality compared to how many that goes to it if we look at some of the municipalities in, over here in Jutland so that is using diagrams, we can place them either as pie charts or as bar charts on top as an overlay of visualizations they are especially good if we want to compare two or more different values and we can control the size of these diagrams by an attribute or calculation on based on an attribute There is one very specialized type of map visualization which is called a cartograph.
cartogram is a map where the area of each unit or each of feature club or features is changed according to a specific attribute. In this case, we have this peculiar looking version of Denmark where the size of each municipality is proportional to the population of that municipality. So we see a gigantic Copenhagen region over here and a slim Jutland. In order to you make cartograms in QGIS, you need to install a plugin. So you're going to a plugins, manage card plugins, and let's let it run. Well, I'm having a network, never mind. Um, and I can say cartogram. So this is the one I installed. In my case, it is installed, so I can only uninstall it. But it's installed, and I can close this thing. You can go into vector, and at the top here we have this cartogram. And you can say create cartogram. And you can say this is the layer I want to work with. And you can say, okay, I want it according to how many people have a master's candidate with answer. And uh, make that map. Um, you, you, more, you, may, you, you, you your higher number of um, iterations you have, the nicer looking map you'll get. But we'll just run it like 5, that's the default value. Say so OK. And wait for it to uh, finish. It, will, it takes some time. It says it up here it's creating cartograms. And uh, once it's finished, we can see it to look at the result. So now it's finished, we can see this extremely large Northern Zealand and these really, really small areas in down in uh, Lowland Falster and in Jotland. So these areas have really few of a university education compared to this very, very large Northern Zealand that we have here. So. Cartograms are, of course, we can change the colors again. So we can go in there. It's a new layer. In this case, it's not saved yet. If you want to keep it for later, you have to say save. Um, but it's a layer. It's a so-called virtual layer. So it's only in memory. So if the computer crashes, it disappears. But we can go in and we can uh, style our layers according to um, whatever. Um, we can style it exactly the same, so we can style it on our candidate, and we can have 10 classes, and we can say apply, and um, so here we can see that the big ones are ads are that have been made into um, have a high value therefore are blue large and we can go in and we can even label our data so go up in labeling and label our data set with the municipality name so here we have the names of our municipalities in this new distorted map of Denmark So that's um, the basic tools we have for doing visualizations of interval and major data. I hope you liked the video. See you. Bye.